A Holiday Task by Saki. Kanelm Jerton entered the dining hall of the Golden Galleon Hotel in the full crush of the luncheon hour. Nearly every seat was occupied, and small additional tables had been brought in, where floor space permitted to accommodate latecomers, with the result that many of the tables were almost touching each other. Jerton was beckoned by a waiter to the only vacant table that was discernible, and took his seat with the uncomfortable and wholly groundless idea that nearly everyone in the room was staring at him. He was a youngish man of ordinary appearance, quiet of dress and unobtrusive of manner, and he could never wholly rid himself of the idea that a fierce light of public scrutiny beat on him as though he had been a notability or a super nut. After he had ordered his lunch, there came an unavoidable interval of waiting, with nothing to do but to stare at the flower vase on his table, and to be stared at, in imagination, by several flappers, some mature beings of the same sex, and a satirical-looking Jew. In order to carry off the situation with some appearance of unconcern, he became spuriously interested in the contents of the flower vase. "'What is the name of these roses? Do you know?' he asked the waiter. The waiter was ready at all times to conceal his ignorance concerning items of the wine list or menu. He was frankly ignorant as to the specific name of the roses. "'Amy Sylvester Partlington,' said a voice at Jerton's elbow. The voice came from a pleasant-faced, well-dressed young woman who was sitting at the table almost touched Jerton's. He thanked her hurriedly and nervously for the information and made some inconsequent remark about the flowers. "'It is a curious thing,' said the young woman, "'that I should be able to tell you the name of those roses without an effort of memory, because if you were to ask me my name, I should be utterly unable to give it to you.' Well, Jerton had not harbored the least intention of extending his thirst for name labels to his neighbor. Well, after her remarkable announcement, however, he was obliged to say something in the way of polite inquiry. Well, yes, answered the lady. I suppose it's a case of partial loss of memory. I was in the train coming down here. My ticket told me I'd come from Victoria and was bound for this place. I had a couple of five-pound notes and a sovereign on me, no visiting cards or any other means of identification, and no idea as to who I am. I can only hazily recollect that I have a title. I am Lady Somebody. Beyond that, my mind is a blank. Well, hadn't you any luggage with you? asked Jerton. Well, that is what I didn't know. I knew the name of this hotel and made up my mind to come here. And when my hotel porter who meets the trains asked if I had any luggage, I had to invent a dressing bag and a dress basket. I could always pretend that they had gone astray. I gave him the name of Smith, and presently he emerged from a confused pile of luggage and passengers with a dressing bag and a dress basket labeled Kestrel Smith. So I had to take them. I don't see what else I could have done. Well, Jerton said nothing, but he rather wondered what the lawful owner of the baggage would do. Of course it was a dreadful arriving at a strange hotel with the name of Kestrel Smith, but it would have been worse to have arrived without luggage. Well, anyhow, I hate causing trouble. Jerton had visions of harassed railway officials and distraught Kestrel Smiths, but he made no attempt to clothe his mental picture in words. The lady continued her story. Naturally, none of my keys would fit the things, but I told an intelligent page boy that I'd lost my key ring and he had the locks forced in a twinkling. Rather too intelligent, that boy. He'll probably end up in Dartmoor. The Kestrel Smith toilet tools aren't up to much, but they are better than nothing. If you feel sure that you have a title, said Jerton, why not get a hold of a peerage and go right through it? Oh, I tried that. I skimmed through the list of the House of Lords in Whitaker, but a mere printed string of names conveys awfully little to one, you know. If you were in an army officer and had lost your identity, you might pour over the army list for months without finding out who you were. I'm going on another tack. I'm going to find out by various little tests who I'm not. That will narrow the range of uncertainty down a bit. You may have noticed, for instance, that I'm lunching princi principally off of Lobster Newburg. Well, Jerton had not ventured to notice anything of the sort. It's an extravagance because it's one of the most expensive dishes on the menu. But at any rate, it proves I'm not Lady Starping. She never touches shellfish. And poor Lady Brattleshrub has no digestion at all. If I am her, I shall certainly die in agony of the course of the afternoon. And the duty of finding out who I am will devolve in the press and the police and those sort of people, and I shall be past caring. Lady Newford doesn't know one rose from another, and she hates men, so she wouldn't have spoken to you in any case. And Lady Mouse Hilton flirts with every man she, men she meets. I haven't flirted with you, have I? Jerton hastily gave the required assurance. Well, you see, continued the lady, that knocks four off the list at once. It'll be a rather lengthy process bringing the list down to one, said Jerton. 
Oh, but of course. There are heaps of them I couldn't possibly be. Women who've got grandchildren or sons old enough to have celebrated their coming of age. I've only got to consider the ones about my own age. I tell you how I, you might help me this afternoon, if you don't mind. Go through any of the back numbers of country life and those sorts of papers that you can find in the smoking room and see if you come across my portrait with an infant son or anything of that sort. It won't take you ten minutes. I'll meet you in the lounge about tea time. Thanks, awfully. And the fair unknown, having graciously pressed Jerton into the search for her lost identity, rose and left the room. As she passed the young man's table, she halted for a moment and whispered, Did you notice I tipped the waiter a shilling? We can cross Lady Elwood off the list. She would have rather died than do that. At five o'clock, Jerton made his way to the hotel lounge. He had spent a diligent but fruitless quarter of an hour among the illustrated weeklies in the smoking room. His new acquaintance was seated at a small tea table, with a waiter hovering in attendance. China tea or Indian? she asked as Jerton came up. China, please, and nothing to eat. Have you discovered anything? Well, only negative information. I'm not Lady Befnell. She disapproves dreadfully of any form of gambling, so when I recognized a well-known bookmaker in the hotel lobby, I went and put a tenor on an unnamed filly by William III out of Mitrovzva for the 315 race. I suppose the fact of the animal being nameless was what attracted me. Did it win? asked Jerton. No, it came in fourth. The most irritating thing a horse can do when you've backed it win or place. Well, anyhow, I know now I'm not Lady Bethnal. Well, it seems to me that the knowledge was rather dearly bought, commented Jerton. Well, yes, it has rather cleared me out, admitted the identity seeker. A florin is about all I've got left on me. The lobster Newberg made my lunch rather an expensive one, and of course, I had to tip that boy for what he did to the Kestrel Smith locks. I've got a rather useful idea, though. I feel certain that I belong to the Pivot Club. I'll go back to town and ask the hall porter if there are any letters for me. He knows all the members by sight, and if there are any letters or telephone messages waiting for me, of course that will solve the problem. If he says there aren't any, I shall say, Well, you know who I am, don't you? So I'll find out anyway. The plan seemed a sound one. A difficulty in its execution suggested itself to Jerton. Well, of course, said the lady when he hinted at the obstacle. There's my fare back to town, and my bill here, my cabs and things. If you'll lend me three pounds, that ought to see me through comfortably. Thanks ever so. Then there's the question of the luggage. I don't want to be saddled with that for the rest of my life. I'll have it brought down to the hall, and you can pretend to mount guard over it while I'm writing a letter. Then I shall just slip away to the station, and you can wander off to the smoking room, and they can do what they like with the things. They'll advertise them after a bit, and the owner can claim them. Jerton acquiesced in the maneuver and dully mounted guard over the luggage while its temporary owner slipped unobtrusively out of the hotel. Her departure was not, however, altogether unnoticed. Two gentlemen were strolling past Jerton, and one of them remarked to the other, Did you see that tall young woman in gray who went out just now? She is the lady. His promenade carried him out of earshot at the critical moment when he was about to disclose the elusive identity. The lady who? Jer Jerton could scarcely run after a total stranger, break into his conversation, ask him for information concerning a chance passers-by. Besides, it was desirable that he should keep up the appearance of looking after the luggage. In a minute or two, however, the important personage, the man who knew, came strolling back alone. Jerton summoned up all his courage and waylaid him. I think I heard you say you knew the lady who went out of the hotel a few minutes ago, a tall lady dressed in gray. Excuse me for asking if you could tell me her name. I've been talking to her for half an hour. She knows all my people and seems to know me, so I suppose I've met her somewhere before. But I'm blessed if I can put a name to her. Could you? Well, certainly. She's a Mrs. Stroop. Mrs.? queried Jerton. Well, yes, she's a lady champion at golf in my part of the world. An awful good sort and goes about a good deal in society. But she has an awkward habit of losing her memory every now and then and she gets into all sorts of fixes. She's furious, too, if you make any allusion to it afterwards. Good day, sir. The stranger passed on his way, and before Jerton had time to assimilate the information, he found his whole attention centered on an angry-looking lady who was making loud and fretful-seeming inquiries of the hotel clerks. Has any luggage been brought here from the station by mistake? A dress basket and a dressing case with the name of Kestrel Smith. It can't be traced anywhere. I saw it put in at Victoria, that I'll swear. Why, there's my luggage, and the locks have been tampered with. Jerton heard no more. He fled down to the Turkish bath and stayed there for hours.